All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is a co-hosted webinar with Revenue.com, of course, and I'm Julie Broad. And we have from StudentRentalInvesting.com, we've got Tim Collins on the line. We've got a pretty cool evening planned for you. And I think you'll agree that uh, Tim's got some pretty awesome experience and knowledge to share with all of you. And you know what? He probably may not want me to tell you this, but I've got the phone and I've got your attention. <laughs> and he can't stop me. So when we first started speaking with him around this time last year, he was already doing quite well as an investor. But he was also interested in ditching a long commute to his job that he was working at at the time. And it was taking precious time away from his family. He has a wife and three boys. Um, he wanted to get into wholesaling deals. That was one of the strategies he was really keen on at the time. Um, so he could get some extra cash and create some options. And some of my clients may think that Dave and I can sometimes burst the bubble that people, you know, they get all excited about certain things. They come to us and, and then we burst their bubble. I'm sure Tim won't say that, not live to over 100 people <laughs> on a webinar. But, you know, <laughs> he probably would tell you that we're realistic and we will tell you what is likely to work and not likely to work consistently. And at the time we said wholesaling is possible, but probably not what he was looking for given his goals, career at the time, and what he wanted to be doing in five years and beyond. And strategies, different strategies, is really what tonight is about. Student rental investing is not a strategy that Dave and I have pursued. Uh, we evaluated it a few times uh, and have always opted to other strategies, but that's the cool beauty of real estate. There's lots of ways to make income and build your wealth. The other side of that, of course, is when there's lots of strategies, figuring out what strategy works for you, knowing what to do, and then, of course, getting off your butt to apply it. Now, we've gotten to know Tim really well in the last year, and he's developed a ton of expertise in the student rental market. He's learned what works, what doesn't, and through a ton of hard work of, and dedication of his own, uh, he, he really has some quality lessons to share, and he's anxious to help others. So I thought it was a perfect match to bring him on the line to help you all out. If you're evaluating student rentals in your own real estate portfolio or thinking about getting into real estate and using student rentals to do it, I thought that this was a perfect opportunity for you to hear from someone who's doing it and doing it really well. Um, so Tim Collins has been investing in real estate since he was 20 years old. He focuses on building his student rental portfolio while also helping others with advice and guidance through his new website, studentrentalinvesting.com. As I already mentioned, Tim is married, has three lovely boys, and resides north of Toronto. He's also active on Twitter, so I highly recommend if you're on Twitter to follow him. His Twitter handle is Real Estate Wins. And of course, I hope if you're on Twitter that you're already connected with me at Revenue. But reach out to Tim on Twitter, say hello, and uh, now we can say hello to Tim live. So welcome, Tim. Hello. <laughs> that, was quite the, that was quite the intro. I feel like a, a heavyweight boxer or something. Well, you're going to come out hitting hard, I think, on these seven tips, so it's appropriate. <laughs> yeah. So why don't I let you kind of kick things off, because you're going to be talking about seven things you need to know about student rentals. And I didn't know if you had any kind of overview of why you pick student rentals or any kind of intro into it before we dive in or if you just want to dive into the seven tips. Yeah, I mean, a, a little intro initially. Um, thanks to Dave and Julie, I'm not a, I'm not a full-time wholesaler. I think that would be <laughs> extremely hard work unless I moved south of the border, but even then still probably a bit too much uh, in terms of what I wanted to bite off. So student rentals... Um, I find particularly interesting. Um, I do, I do like the engagement with um, students are, are kind of fresher and, and kind of keen and a, a great point in their life where they want to get on and achieve and do things. And I just find them kind of a pleasure to deal with. As you'll see when we go through the seven tips, it's not all, um, it's not all bread and honey, but uh, they, on the whole, they're, they're great to deal with and, and kind of refreshing. Um, some of my previous tenants back in back in England where I hail from originally not quite so refreshing. So student rentals for me was just something I thought, here's something I can get my, my teeth into, here's something I can focus on. I, like a lot of people, was really interested um, because of the fantastic cash flow. And there is, there is uh, depending on kind of where you buy and how you manage it, there is, there is great cash flow available. But uh, 
I've learned over the last year that you, you pay for it. Um, out of all the uh, types of investing, whether it's rent to own or multi, uh, multi-tenant units or, or single family, student rental certainly has the most cash flow. Um, again, depending on factors, but also probably has the most work involved. Now, whether you do all that work yourself or whether you get people to help you is, is something we can talk about. But um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, been a, it's been a great learning curve so far. So yeah, when we step into some of the tips, um, as I was putting this together with, um, with, with Julie, we kind of I've picked some of the main things to talk about. Most of these topics are super expansive. There's a lot more to get into, so we've kind of just just picked some high-level ones that there should be great topics of conversation, whether you've been student rental investing for a while, whether it's new to you, hopefully you find this interesting. And so, I'll just let yeah, oh sorry. sorry, I'll just let everybody know. So if you have questions, what we'll do is I'll be monitoring them and I'll be chiming in, um, you know, interrupting Tim. <laughs> Um, but but uh, if you have questions, there's two ways to ask questions. Uh, if you're sitting in front of your computer, the easiest way is probably just to type it in. And if it fits with the tip that we're talking about, I will just go ahead and chime in and ask and ask him at the time. Um, if it is something that is a great question related to student rentals, uh, we're not going to get into other strategies tonight. We're going to focus on student rental investing. So if it is a great question related to student rental investing, um, but it doesn't fit with what we're talking about at that moment, I will bring up all the questions at the end. Uh, so we'll get to it, but um, I just wanted to let you know that typing it in is probably the best. But at the end, if you want to say hello to Tim, um, tell him what a great job he did, and uh, ask him a question live, you know, we do love to hear other people's voices. So you have the ability to raise your hand, and then at the end, I will be able to unmute you. I'll give you a heads up. You know, I would say, hey, Wes, we're about to unmute you. I'm not unmuting you right now, Wes, just so you know. But hey, Wes, we're about to unmute you. You can go ahead and ask your question. So we'll, we'll handle all those at the end. Otherwise, I'll just monitor what you type in, and uh, we'll try and get it done as we go if it makes sense. Um, <laughs> and uh, for those of you commenting about the Leafs winning, you know, enjoy it while you can. That's all I can say. <laughs> All right, Tim, take it away. Uh, the Leafs went in tonight because I, I, I've been busy uh, preparing for this, so I didn't even look at the score. But anyway. apparently, apparently they are. We have some people cheering right. for them. <laughs> well, it's nice. It's been a nice start to the year for sure. It, it has, it has. But yeah. don't plan your Stanley Cup parade just yet. No. <laughs> All right, go for it. Okay, so um, starting off with with location. So. As we all know, students love to sleep, and uh, with that in mind, it's, it's useful if they can be close to where they go to school. So it's a bit of a joke, but ultimately, students want to be close to the institution they're attending. Um, most of the, the kids we speak to and, and most of the ads we look at on Kijiji, where they're getting more money per room, tend to be in the areas closest to the school. They want to walk to school if they can. Um, now, it's not possible everywhere, depending on where you are in the country and what university. Sometimes there isn't residences to buy and rent out directly next to the university, but in a lot of cases there are. In most cases there are, I would say, especially uh, in the areas I invest in. And uh, they like to be close. Uh, we recently bought a place near McMaster University um, in Hamilton, and it's not, the, it's, not, it's not the house that's on this slide, actually, because that's a beautiful house. The house in question isn't a particularly nice looking house. It's kind of vinyl siding, it's a bit old, it, it doesn't look amazing from curb appeal point, point of view, but inside the rooms are big, um, we've made it clean, we've put nice flooring in, so it's in great shape now. But the thing that really attracted me to it, and the thing that attracted the students to it and made sure it was filled within a couple of weeks, is that you can see the university if you stand in the street outside. So anybody that came by for a viewing, I say, well, you know, it's a, it's a good 10 minute walk, but you can see the school and people will be like, oh yeah, that, that's great. So not just um, showing them that, but also when I did the Kijiji ad, I had pictures and I, in my title for my ad, I said, I can, you, you can see the school from here or you can see the university from here. Um, and that just got us a, a, a fantastic response. Um, that's not to say if you have a really nice house outside walking distance that people won't take the bus. They absolutely will do, but they, they may expect a slight concession on their monthly rent. Um, depending on the situation, uh, they, they may be prepared to take the bus. A lot of 
universities and colleges now include bus passes in tuition. So cost-wise, in terms of them paying for transport, they're probably not going to be worried about it. But there's something um, that the students just feel good about being able to walk to school. Um, it's also good for you as an investor or an owner to know where the amenities are. So where's the supermarket? Um, where's the corner store? Where's the pub, God forbid? Although you probably shouldn't be telling them where that is. They'll find out on their own. But where are all these things that they're going to need to use? If you're an expert on your area, which you should be, um, you should be able to tell them where these things are. So picking a great location is really about thinking from a student's point of view, where would I want to be? Um, I want to be close to school. I want to be close to entertainment and shopping, um, but ultimately close to school. And the, there's a slight caveat in that, in, in that um, a lot of people don't want to live directly opposite on the other side of the street from the school because that might be a bit too close for comfort. But within a 10, 15 minute walk seems to be ideal. Um, the picture in this slide is a house we bought in Welland, Ontario. Um, and uh, that, that is actually two semi-detached houses side by side. Welland, Ontario is home of uh, one of the Niagara College campuses. Um, they recently spent about $95 million on Niagara College. Um, so it's just an amazing facility. And this house happens to be on the only spare piece of land about 300 meters from the main entrance to the school. Everywhere else around there is kind of older bungalows, probably 30, 40 year old bungalows, which don't look particularly nice. I mean, they work and, and uh, they can certainly be, be made functional for people to live in, for students to live in. But Imagine that we've got these, this small plot of land with eight semi-detached houses on just down the road, and the students are kind of walking in for the, for the open house to have a look and saying, I need, I need to buy one of these, I need to sign up for one of these rooms right now. Like That's how good a condition they, they're in. So for me, that's kind of student rental utopia. I don't expect that. That isn't a strategy. Um, I don't expect it to happen very often, but kind of early in my student investing career, I saw that as a massive opportunity and grabbed one of those houses myself and also bought a second one with a joint venture partner because I just thought for the cost of the house and the fundamentals of the, the investment, it was just too good to, to miss. Um, obviously, you're not going to worry about things like the roof or the furnace for some time. So oh, those are, those are good-looking houses. When Actually, I didn't even know. Um, I've seen interior pictures of this house, but I don't think I've ever seen the exterior. Um, yeah. and, and I thought this was a stock image. <laughs> it's such a nice-looking house and a great picture that I didn't even realize that it was actually one of your student rentals. Yeah, they are lucky students. Uh, they are. <laughs> Most it's funny, people actually, don't live when in we were, we had the, I kind of organized, I'll talk a, a bit later on about leases and stuff, but um, I organized all the kids to come by on the same day, and obviously all the parents came as well because we always get the leases countersigned by the parents. Take note mm -hmm. of that. Um, and uh, most of the parents who came in were saying, this is, this is too nice to be a student rental. Like, I, this is nicer than our house. How can my, <laughs> how can my kid live here? Well, I have to live at home. <laughs> That's so, fantastic. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if there is such a thing as too nice for students, but um, if I was renovating it, then that would probably be over-engineered. But the fact that that was built has, in that situation, four bedrooms upstairs, two great bedrooms in the basement, two kitchens, two common areas. It's just a great place. Uh, and that's also, Welland is on a public transportation bus line which connects to St. Catharines and Niagara Falls. So there's that little triangle down there as well. Um, so you've got to know the knowledge about the location uh, and, and, and pick great locations as well. You do find that there's kind of a couple of exceptions to this rule. You do find that mature students um, or graduates often don't want to live in the epicenter of noise and distraction that first or second year students might do. And they, they are the types of people who would be prepared to live a bus ride away because they want to live in a nicer house with a backyard and a bit more quiet than perhaps the, the typical sort of immediate student rental area. Um, and although this house in the picture here is looks wonderful, um, most of the time we're looking for, for functional properties, not beautiful properties. The students aren't going to be planting flowers in the garden and uh, growing vegetables. They, they're using it to live there. They, you know, 
distance is more important than how aesthetically pleasing it looks from the outside. Um, so I think that's I think that's most of it uh, in terms of picking a great location. I don't know if you've got anything to add, Julie, to that. Yeah, I just want to reinforce, you know, this, you know, we're talking student rentals, but a lot of these tips apply to real estate investing in general. And and Tim hit the nail on the head with regards to thinking about what your student wants. And that's what you always have to do with your investments. Think about your tenant. Who is your ideal tenant? And so if you're doing student rentals, your ideal tenant, even thinking about whether it's a first year, a second year, a third year, a fourth year student, what do they want? Right? These are some of the things that you want to think about when you're looking for the properties. And uh, you, know, you talked about all of that in terms of location, but as you have already alluded to, it matters. It, you know, there's a difference between a first year and a fourth year and a grad student. They're, they're all looking for slightly different locations and possibly slightly different amenities. So you kind of want to know who you're targeting. And I know your target is uh, typically the, fresh, the you know, first year, second year kind of students, right? Yeah, absolutely, because I'm trying to hook them in for multiple years. Um, mm -hmm. By by having houses which are um, above the standard, which is what we try to do, so we look at the the kind of stock of student rental houses by um, pretending I'm a student occasionally and walking into open uh, open houses for for student rentals and calling the numbers and looking around some of these places. Um, I want to see what the competition's like, and that that's something I would recommend as well. Um, don't just look on Google Maps and see where the house is and and decide that it's 900 meters away from the university, so that's fine. You should get out there and uh, pound the pavement, walk around, get a feel for the environment and, and, and see what the houses are like, walk the distance, um, and, and go into, I'm, I, even now when I'm in the areas where I already own houses, I'll still phone up the for rent signs and just see how much are they renting the rooms for. If there's anybody around, I'd like to take a quick, quick look because I want to constantly have a barometer on how nice are these places being kept in? What's my competition? It's a, it's a competition for sure in terms of the students looking at these houses are going to have gone to three, four, five places on the day they come to your house. So you better have either the best looking house or the best price and you don't want to have the best price. So we're always trying to make sure that our house is not, not like the one in the picture necessarily every time because that would be difficult. But we want to make sure that if the other places have got stinky carpets and and beds laying, laying down the side of the house, we want to make sure ours are spotless, clean, nice laminate wood floors or whatever it happens to be, because you know people are gonna people are gonna judge and people are gonna make a choice. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, two key points: boots. To, I always say boots to the ground. You know, you got to get out there. No matter what kind of investing you're doing, you need to get out there. And the other thing is, you know, being an area expert does involve looking at what's what else is for sale, what else is for rent. So those are fantastic tips. Hope you guys are writing all this down. Um, Lincoln, I think we answered your question about where Tim is investing. But but uh, Tim, do you want to just kind of recap where you have your student rentals? Yeah. So I'm based, as you said, I'm based north of Toronto, but mo the, the areas, or I normally just talk about the institutions that I focus around, would be Hamilton, so McMaster and Mohawk. And then I mentioned Welland, which is where Niagara, Col Niagara College is. And then just down the road from there is Brock University and in St. Catharines. So those are the four places. Um, that's kind of already enough. Uh, and uh, any, of you know, any of you that know Julie knows that she talks about focusing a lot so she kind of beats me up to refine my focus um, more and more and because uh, you need to know. You need to know the streets. You need to know the schools. You need to know the programs. And uh, if you want to do a really good job, you need all that information. Absolutely, and, and Mike and Mike has made a good point about Saskatoon because um, he said in Saskatoon, walking distance properties uh, to I believe you're probably talking about the University of Saskatchewan, but he said walking distance properties are the most expensive real estate in Saskatoon, um, and they're not zoned for you know that kind of like rental. So he said they have areas that are 10 minute bus ride away that are more student oriented. So this is why it's so important to always be your own area expert and, and to get to know your university and the area around your university because what's going to work, uh, you know, Tim's laying out his model, but you might have to tweak it for whatever area you decide to invest in. And, and it might not even make sense, right? Your own university might have tons of housing and there might not be enough demand for it. So you have to do your own research to make sure that it'll work in your area. So thanks for yeah. that, Mike. Yeah, Mike's absolutely right, and 
I've never been to Saskatoon, but hopefully one day I can I can get out there. Um, but another good example of that is is Brock University in St. Catharines. It's kind of just outside the town, so there is no residential housing around that university. They do have quite a lot of uh, residents uh, housing there, but where people live is a bus right away close to an area called the Penn Center, which is like a big shopping mall and entertainment area. Um, and all the streets around there are just, you know, student housing um, set up set up all over the place. So yeah, you absolutely have to apply this to your local geography, and it's going to be, you know, um, slightly different wherever you are. Awesome. Oh, and just one more question that came in here. I'm trying. To, there's actually lots. You guys are you guys are very talkative, which is awesome. We're gonna have we're gonna have lots to go through tonight. Um, but a question coming from Craig, uh, saying that Hamilton was rated number one in Ontario for rain. Has the boat already sailed in Hamilton? Regards to getting in on a good deal before it taken off. What are your thoughts on that? Because I am not a Hamilton guy. Uh, girl, I'm not a guy at all. <laughs> oh. um, I mean, I'm exceptionally lucky because I work with. Uh, Realtors who who really focus on Hamilton, I would say people have been. I mean, and, and you can correct anybody can correct me because I'm not totally up on the amount of time. But people have been ranking Hamilton in the top ten for you know maybe five years, maybe longer than that. Um, so I found out about it, um, you know, some year, a couple of years ago. I found out about it through the same kind of reports in Rain or in Real Estate Wealth magazine or wherever it was saying. This is a great place to invest, and literally that's why I picked it. Um, I wasn't there wasn't any genius behind me going there. Um, and if anybody's read any of my other stuff, um, I just picked Hamilton and said that's great. I grabbed the local realtor, went downtown, found a house where the numbers worked, and, and bought a house, which in hindsight was a was a horrific mistake. Um, but uh, but. And for the record, I, this was before that we worked with him. Yeah, was before <laughs> before Julie's coaching. Julie's coaching is good. Um, yeah, so I wanted to get stuck in, and I bought a, a duplex, and it was in the wrong part of town, and the tenant profile is not fantastic. I still own it today, and I'm making it work. But um, in answer to the question, um, I still think there's loads of opportunity there. Um, I've, you know, I bought places very recently in Hamilton, and if you look at places like McMaster, if you if you ever look at McMaster on a map, there's kind of a finite amount of houses in that area it's, it's bordered by the 403 and the escarpment on one side so you just got to look in there and find um, find value and, and, and make the numbers work for you but uh, I mean I don't want the competition so maybe you should look somewhere else but um, <laughs> not, but no I think Hamilton's Hamilton's still good and uh, you know whoever asked that question I can definitely put you in touch with people that would be able to help you out in terms of looking for places yeah, and we'll, we'll have uh, lots of contact information, lots of ways to get in touch with Tim at the end of this. So if anybody has specific things they want to reach out to him on, um, he may regret it, but he's providing his email address. <laughs> mm -hmm. Go ahead. I've set up <laughs> a right, special so folder for it. Yeah. <laughs> Should we move on to number two? <laughs> yeah, why not? So the next one is about choosing your tenants carefully. And this was this was all new to me because uh, I don't know why I just assumed everybody would be honest and upfront, but... Um, as I said here, not all students are the same, and not all your applicants will be students. So, some of the slides in this in this presentation um, this evening will depend on whether you are actively involved yourself or whether you have a property manager. But for me, it kind of doesn't matter if you're serious about it. You need to be involved in the business. You know, whether it's on an ad hoc basis or every day depends on how involved you want to be. But you, you should still be involved. I still select all of my tenants myself. Um, although I do have a, a property manager who kind of takes the first call for any maintenance issues or anything like that. I'm still selecting the tenants because I want to make sure I've got you know good quality people living in my houses um, and I want to be involved in the process. So if you, put, if you put a beautiful ad on Kijiji with lovely pictures and a nice description and, and you're kind of telling this emotional story of how close it is to the college and you can stroll down the road and um, the birds are singing and all that kind of stuff, you're going to attract a lot of responses. And not all of those responses will be from students. You're going to get some people who just say, that sounds amazing. $450 a month to live in that place. I want one. Um, but unfortunately, they're not students. They could be, an, you know, I mean, I've had all sorts, but sometimes they're, they're single people who are, who are grown up. Sometimes they've got jobs. Sometimes they haven't got jobs. 
Um, and the dynamic of having non-students living with students, for me, just doesn't work very well um, because you've got students who are typically on a schedule of going to school and studying and coming back and having downtime, and then you've got people who are working who are just, you know, somewhere, some other place in their life, and, and uh, it just doesn't gel very well. I've tried it, and uh, I've had issues. Um, and for me, trying it was because how I got into that situation was because you get a house, a student house, typically, you know, for me, my average rooms would be six rooms in a house. And I thought, well, I'll get this Kijiji ad up and I'll see if I can see how quickly I can fill this place. So you just, and so when I wasn't aware of this, these, the just normal people applying for student rooms, I was just taking everybody at their word and saying, yeah, no problem, in you come. Um, so I'm not sure whether I'd call it greed, but I was trying to, um, trying to get the, the rooms full quickly with students. And it turned out some of the people I put in there weren't students. Um, one of the, one of them was a, was a young man who, uh, Said he was going to college. I didn't verify it. I didn't ask for his um, letter of acceptance or admission, um, which which is something I now do. And I just said, yeah, fine, go for it. Um, and it turns out he's he's unemployed, so he's at home all day, every day, um, and you know doing doing things which uh, students don't necessarily want to be involved in, drinking too much and that kind of thing. Well, maybe they do, but um, not during the day. So in that case, that, that was just a, a not good situation. I had to I had to move them out of there. Um, there's other situations where where you're going to get people um, applying for the rooms, and you can just tell that that, that they're not going to be a good fit. So I'm, I'm now kind of much clearer, and I say to people as soon as I speak to them, you are a student or you are in full-time education, correct? Um, which college are you going to? Don't assume that they're going to McMaster because it's close to McMaster. Ask them. Um, tell them that as part of their application form, they'll need to submit a letter of acceptance into the course that they go into. Um, this may sound like additional work, but it's a lot better to do it up front than to try and affect somebody who's clearly not a student and is causing you problems. Peter, Peter on the line has mentioned that he asks to see their student card. Um, yep. He agrees. He said, he said true, students and non-students does not work. So, yeah. No. Um, so, and yeah, student card, letter of admission, whatever it is, you need to make sure that they are a student. Um, there's other things which which are considerations as well. Like if they're not um, if they're not students and you're filling them up in in rooms in your house, you're in Ontario anyway. You're running a rooming house, which is not something you want to get involved in. Different bylaws, different insurance, and uh, not a good place to be if that's not what you want to do. So just you know, uh, make sure you qualify people to to uh, to make sure they are who you want. Um, and, and the other point on here, in, in terms of, do you select tenants or does a property manager do it for you? Again, to me that doesn't really matter. You should either be doing it yourself or have a close enough relationship with your property manager to say, this is the profile of people we're looking for. You know, let's avoid non-students. Let's ask them these qualifying criteria. Get them to fill in the form, submit their information before we accept them. You're going to have, you know, better quality students. They're going to take care of your house, um, less problems, less phone calls, less incidents, um, and everything will just run a lot smoother. Uh, and then from there, you kind of move on to, well, all right, we've decided they are students. Now what? Well, you, then you just want to try and identify good quality people to, to live in your places. With students, because they're because of their age. Um, Doing a credit check isn't really going to help you because they, they likely haven't got any. Um, for international students, then clearly that isn't going to work. So you're going to have to go off um, much more of a kind of human interview process to see, you know, are they, do they seem responsible? Um, can they fill out the application form properly? Uh, and, and kind of how do they how do they come across to you? It sounds a bit, to some people it sounds a bit a bit wishy washy, but your, your gut instinct and your intuition on what you think of people is, is most of the time correct. Um, for me, on the few occasions when I've thought, I'm not sure about this guy, but it's five o'clock, I've been here all day, and I've just got this last room to fill, so yeah, go ahead, sign the forms, and we'll, we'll get the deposit taken care of. That has come back to bite me every time. Every time I thought it was, this is a little bit strange, or he's asking too many questions, or whatever it happens to be 
going to come back and bite you. So don't do it. I mean, it's, it's classic in real estate to say it's better to have an empty room than a bad tenant, and it's so true. Um, I was once standing in the, the living room of one of my houses waiting for a student to turn up who said he was coming with a couple of friends to look at a room, um, waiting for them to turn up, and they were late. So no problem. I mean, I'm not going to, in a normal... Uh, in a normal situation, when you're meeting somebody they're late, then that that could tell you something. I wouldn't necessarily apply that to students because they're, you know, they they can be disorganised. Um, but I watched these these three young men meandering up the street, drinking beer, uh, walking up the street, which, in Ontario, as I understand it, is uh, illegal, so you can't do that. <laughs> um, in England, you can get away with it, but not here. And um, in Las Vegas, but. <laughs> and in Vegas, yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, so I watched them kind of walking up the street, and then they kind of uh, hid the uh, cans behind the behind the lamp posts in the front yard, and and kind of walked up towards the door and knocked on the door. Um, so I opened the door and showed them around because I didn't want to I didn't want to create any immediate conflict. But they smell of alcohol, and they walked around, and they they seemed they seemed nice enough. Um, and I said, yeah, take an application, scan it, and email it back to me. And when they when they when the the one guy sent the application back, I just emailed back and said, "Sorry, it's already it's already full." Um, and the reason I did that was because I just you know, it, it seems to me that somebody who would openly kind of drink beer walking up to look a uh, house for rent probably isn't the kind of person who's going to take care of it for me. Um, so I didn't accept that tenant. Um, I had another. I, I have another tenant currently who who also kind of got my. Um, intuition going when I when I met him to sign the lease. So everything was fine during the deposit taking time and and the application. And when we met to sign the lease, he painstakingly went through every bullet point on the lease, which is fine and it's his prerogative. But he was kind of arguing with me as though he wanted me to take out a pen and mark up the lease and change all the terms on this standard document, which I've run by lawyers and had approved. And I wasn't I'm, I wasn't going to change it for him. So I did my Typical thing of explaining it to him, and you know, painstakingly going through each each point, and finally he was satisfied. And but it was just it was just a lot of work. Um, since then, that young man's been a lot of work all the time. Um, and if I could go back, I would probably at that point say, if if you're uncomfortable with it, then I think it's best if we if we don't proceed at this point. Um, I didn't force him into it in, in any way. I just basically talked through each of the points and explained the rationale behind it. But anyway, in that case, it was like too many questions is probably going to be too much communication moving forward. Um, and then the other consideration is you've got kind of mixes of students. So you'll see ads out there for all girls and ads for mixed houses. Funnily enough, you don't see too many ads for all guys. but. Um, there's going to be different different blends of people. As I mentioned, you've got first-year students with mature students. Sometimes that can work. Sometimes it doesn't work. Um, it's normally the mature students, when they're looking at a house, uh, will say, who else is going to live here? Um, and in some cases, it's like, well, you're the first person who's looking around. Well, when you get back to me, when you know who, who else is going to live here, because I want to live with other, other people who are serious about getting their work done, and aren't going to be up late playing music. So... Be aware of those um, those potential kind of mixings. You've got international students. I don't do a lot with international students myself, but I know people who do and who have good connections, and that can work very well. Um, typically, they're very you know quiet and they just want to be here to get on with their work, uh, and they're very um, reliable in terms of paying. And then the last thing is um, singles or groups. So later on, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about when should you advertise or when should you fill a student house. But singles or groups, and what I mean by that is, should you sign people up one by one as they come in through the door, or should you try and get six people together or five people together or, or two groups of three? Um, and I've heard arguments for both, and I have situations of both. Um, the arguments for, for groups is probably the easiest one and the one I would lean slightly towards, which is they all know each other. Um, it's going to be easier to, to get them all together at the same time, sign the lease together, um, collect payments, and they're probably going to want to stay together for a long time. So that was my that was my belief uh, for the longest time. And then recently I was speaking to my property manager, and he said, actually, I like singles because I find the groups tend to have more um, social gatherings, uh, if that's the best way to put it. 
um, and uh, the individuals who are kind of probably out of towners from from somewhere else tend to just go about their business and and get on with it. So um, it depends is the, is the answer to that one. But the main overriding thing is you want to um, don't just accept anybody. Do it like you would do any other type of rental investment and make sure you qualify your prospective tenants and uh, make sure you're happy to have them them live in there for the, for the period of time they're going to be there. Fantastic. Now there's lots of questions and comments coming in, but a lot of them are about the lease, which I know we're going to talk about next. So um, Angie, Mark, and Corinne, um, you guys are all asking questions about the lease. So that we'll, we'll cover that next, and if we don't, then feel free to ask uh, your questions again. Um, and then another person, we're probably going to cover this, I know we're going to talk a little bit about marketing later, but um, mm. I thought it was a really good question that Mike brought up. Um, it, he basically said, I wonder if you aren't marketing more to the students' parents than the actual students. So since you're talking about choosing your tenants carefully, I thought we might bring that up, unless you're talking specifically about that later. Um, I don't know if I am or not, but let's do it anyway. Okay. Um, so uh, you are, yeah, and I think in, in everything you do, you're kind of marketing to the parents in terms of how you differentiate yourself from other landlords or, or owners out there. So what does the house look like? What's the quality of your Kijiji ad? What's your, what are your organ, organizational skills like in terms of the documentation you provide? Everybody isn't going to have an application form, uh, a student rental lease, Student rental rules and uh, rules and regulations is a separate document that I have. Um, so I think it's in your in your overall package in terms of because when I meet the parents, they say you know we're impressed with your professionalism and how nice how nice your house is and how you know how well you've communicated the the various things that the kids need to know to the kids. So I think on a on a superficial level, the parents are going to be interested in making sure their their kids don't live in a in a dump, um, they're going to want to make sure they live somewhere nice, uh, and then after that, through the through the kind of qualification period, I think how you how you deal with them is going to going to give them assurance and and make them happy that um, you know they're dealing with somebody who's reputable and who's got their kids' best interests at heart. And especially because your focus again is on the the first years, which the parents are often involved in in looking for uh, where their where their child is going to go to university, versus a fourth year whose parents probably never come to see where they live. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for sure, in some cases, like one that once the mature students, the parents aren't aren't involved anymore. The checks may still be written by the parents, and they may still mm -hmm. kind of sign the lease, but they're not around looking at houses anymore because they appreciate that they're. 21-year-old son or daughter is capable of doing it on their own. Which is one of the other questions with regards to the parents. Um, are you credit checking the parents who are also signing the lease? No. Okay. No. Just too much. Uh, and too – I just I, – I, maybe, maybe it's the amount of money because we're, we're talking about – in most cases, somewhere between, in, in, again, in, in my specific region, we're talking about between $400 and $500 a month. Um, most of these parents have been saving and budgeting for this for some time. They're not, they're not going to interrupt their child's education by not paying their rent, right? Yeah. It's pretty serious. It's different to somebody who's, you know, isn't in university and they're in their mid-20s and they, they're renting out a place on their own. It's, you know, this is... This is what they've been waiting for. Like they want them to get through it. So I haven't, I haven't, I haven't had a bounce check. I haven't had uh, somebody not wanting to pay because uh, they're serious about making sure their their child's taken care of. Yeah. So that that James and Mike were both asking about rent defaults and things like that. So that that should answer that question. And it, this goes for all real estate investing. I know many of you are already quite active investors, but choosing your tenants carefully, screening, you know, gut instinct, checking everything that you can check reduces a lot of the problems. That doesn't mean you're not going to have a bad apple, you know, out of, you know, eventually you're going to have a bad apple. Pretty much it's, it's inevitable. But the more you do in terms of screening and not getting desperate, right? Tim talked about when he took somebody because he, you know, anxious to fill it, to get it done, whatever it is, to get the cash in the door. Um, that's when you get that person who's going to bounce the check, who's going to do damage usually. So sticking to your process and screening and taking care, um, you'll reduce that. That doesn't mean it's not going to happen, but 
it'll be minimal because everybody was the, the questions that were coming in were basically asking if you've had any luck going after the guarantor or the cosigner, but you haven't had it happen. Haven't had to do it for that reason. I have had to do it for damage reasons. Okay, so how did that go? So one of the one of the the things I explained to the parents is, in addition to them, if they're responsible for the payment, is if anything's damaged, so a window's broken, a door's broken, something happens, then they are in 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 turn responsible for uh, replacing that and making it right. Uh, and a couple of times I've had to invoke that in terms of I had somebody who put a hole in the door which looked about the right size for it to be a fist. And uh, I questioned questioned the young man about it, and he said, yeah, that was me. And I said, how do you want to take care of this? And he said, just phone my dad. So I phoned his dad, and his dad said, I didn't. I was I was nice about it. I said, there's been some damage to a door. I'm not sure how it happened, but uh, your son said uh, he caused it. And the dad said, well, just please replace the door and tell me how much it costs, and I'll send you a check. And he did. Um, so again, I think, and, and like you said, you're we're not going to go through life and not have problems with tenants and not have issues with people not paying. But back to the fact of in in uh, in all these cases, these kids are trying to make something of themselves. They're going to university or college. They're trying to get a qualification. Their parents want them to do that. Um, they don't want them to get in trouble and get kicked out of the student rental house they're living in. Um, so that was one of the things getting into this I expected to have more problems with and has been you know, something I've had less problems with. Awesome. Well, yeah. I know lots of people are anxious to hear about the lease, so should we move on to number three? If I can get my arrow up. There we go. Yeah, sure. All right. So the lease. The lease. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you've got to have a student lease is the first thing. Um, uh, I was luckily given a, a student lease, which I've um, kind of run by my lawyer independently to make sure it's, um, kind of up to par and covers all the necessary things and, and I would encourage any of you to do that as well if you get a lease from somebody else don't and, and first of all obviously make sure you read it and understand it all because um, a lot of people don't because um, they're boring and long who wants to read a lease um, but also um, get, get some independent legal advice and give it to your lawyer who's, who's hopefully real estate savvy and get them to have a read through and make sure it's uh, covering all your best interests um, so student leases are different to single family home leases because they're spelling out some more some more fundamental things in terms of um, payments in terms of making sure that if uh, you know from a fundamental point of view you've got six people living in a house which was probably designed for for a small family so you're going to have more foot traffic more wear and tear potentially um, higher utility bills all those things need to be accounted for um, I'm going to come on to cleaning a bit later on, one of my favorite topics. Um, but <laughs> cleaning also needs to be covered in there. I like talking about it, I just don't like doing it very much. Um, cleaning needs to be covered in there. Obviously, things which may be in a normal lease, like no pets, no smoking, no parties. Uh, and what I do is then I um, take out, I extract from my student lease all of the main pertinent kind of chunky points that I really want to. I really want them to understand and take on. And I put that in a separate document. I have um, rules and regulations document, which just goes through those bullet points and says, you understand, you can't drill holes in the wall, you can't park unlicensed cars on the front lawn, and, and, and so on and so forth. And go through all those points with them, get them to initial them, and get them to, to understand um, kind of what they're responsible for. In, in Ontario, um, the student rental housing, student rental houses are, are classed as single family residences from a zoning point of view. Um, and essentially that means that all areas of the house are shared. So shared kitchens, bathrooms, common rooms, uh, etc. are shared. If you, if you start breaking them up and if you start having each of the students sign an independent lease, then effectively you're running a rooming house. And again, if that's your business, fine. But if you're trying to be in student rentals, then you're going to have some problems uh, potentially down the line with your local city or insurance uh, if you start getting into that area. So, uh, and as it 
Oh, sorry. I'll just mention while we're talking about it because it is a good point to mention. Every province and even every city is going to have different laws and different um, zoning and bylaws and fire codes. So you will want to check with your city and your, your fire codes that, that are applicable to you just to understand what you need to. And we say this all the time, right? As soon as you have two suites in a property or you're renting it out, you want to make sure that you're, you, you're kind of keeping up with the bylaws, the zoning requirements, um, and of course the fire codes and uh, and like you said insurance you want always want to let your insurance company know what you're doing or what you're planning to do because you do not want to have an insurance claim and find out your insurance is void because the insurance company didn't uh, didn't know that you were doing a student rental yeah so I don't I, I, in this presentation we don't even talk about insurance there's so many things to talk about we could go on forever but um, you need to have insurance which is specifically relevant for student rentals and they are out there um, they're not actually massively more expensive as you might think, but they may be a little bit more expensive, but you want to make sure that you're properly covered for the type of tenant that you're looking after. In this case, students, you need to make sure you've got student rental insurance. There are companies that provide it and have great policies which cover you for all sorts of things you probably hadn't even thought of. Um, and as I say in, on this slide here, look, most of these kids have never signed a lease before in their lives. So that's why I make a point of of really kind of hammering home the, the things that I'm most interested in protecting um, and making sure they comply with. So you've got to walk them through it. Um, don't just turn to the last page and get them to sign it. You've got to kind of walk through it and say, here's the pertinent points. Here's the things that you're responsible for. If this happens, these are the consequences, et cetera, so they know and they're aware of it. Um, the big ones for me, um, haven't been things like people sublet in rooms, although occasionally you'll, you'll find two people in a room which was designated for one person. So that's something that you need to, either you or the property manager need to be around reasonably frequently to, to take care of that side of things and just remind people that it's in the lease that people can't stay for more than a certain number of consecutive nights. They can have guests, but if it becomes somebody else's uh, place where they spend more time than not, then they're effectively living there too, and that doesn't work. Um, the, uh, the, I've got a bit of a funny story about a cat. So if you're a cat lover on the phone, I apologize. Um, <laughs> no, it's not nothing, nothing against cats. They're, they're fine animals. But in this case, they're not, uh, it's not a great place to have animals in a student rental house. Um, as I said, you've already got six people in there. You've got lots of bodies moving around and um, dishes and you know people in the shower and just lots of lots of uh, enough kind of pressure on the house without having animals there as well. So I'm really firm on um, no pets and I'm allergic to cats, so that also doesn't help. But I, I did have a student who turned up with a kitten one day, um, and I was I was walking around this uh, this student house and I noticed a, uh, an unpleasant smell. And then I saw uh, what I thought was a litter tray, and then I opened another door, and there was kind of cat kibbles in the corner of the room, and I was like, what's, what's going on? So I got, found the student and said, you know, what's going on? And as I was talking to him, a little kitten scurried out between his legs. Um, and I said, um, you know, as per the lease, your cat has to go um, because there can't be any pets here. In addition to the fact that I'm allergic, um, there just can't be any pets in a student house. I just don't think it's a good idea at all. Um, subsequently found out, just to uh, make the story uh, even more interesting, that the cat had got behind um, the washer and dryer and in behind the back of the wall and uh, uh, peed and pooped behind the wall and caused some mold and damage to the drywall. And, and uh, so it turned out to be not only um, an issue for the, for the other tenants in you know in the time that the cat was there that I didn't even know it was there in a couple of weeks. It also caused some some damage that had to be taken care of. Um, the the straw that broke the camel's back was that um, I had stored in the in the garage of this property. I'd I'd had stored a, a kitchen like kitchen cabinets and stuff that I was planning to use somewhere else. I just left it there for a bit. And uh, one day I went to collect it. The day after I told this guy to get rid of the cat. And uh, I said, there's a drawer missing out of the this set of drawers which goes on the wall in the kitchen. Do you know where it is? And he said, oh, yes, yeah, it's, uh, 
it's in the basement. I said, well, can you get it? And he said, well, I don't think you'll want it. And I said, why not? And he said, that's what I've been using as a litter box. <laughs> I was like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, Sorry, that probably was not funny for you. But <laughs> it wasn't very funny, funny at the time, no. <laughs> wasn't very funny at the time, but we can laugh now. That's okay. But yeah, that. So just examples like that. <clears throat> um, and again, you know, animals definitely have their place in families and stuff. But in student rentals, I just would say absolutely not on any occasion that it's ever brought up and spell it out. Um, I kind of always say to the students, no cats, no dogs, no animals, no goldfish, no hamsters, and they always think it's funny. But I'm like, no, seriously, you can't. None of those things. And they're like, okay. Um, the other thing which is in the lease which you'll need to enforce is um, students, um, independent young people that they are, like to have all their own amenities in their room. Um, so the lease clearly spells out you can't have your own independent air conditioning unit or heater or fridge, which they love to have many fridges. Um, I've turned a lot of students' mums and dads away with many fridges. Um, and the big one is always the microwave because in addition to it being um, it's going to cost you more money in electricity, it's also um, would, would void people's insurance in some cases if you have microwaves in bedrooms. Not good. So those are, that's one of the things to spell out is none of those appliances can be in bedrooms in addition to the risk and um, uh, you know the, the overhead from that point of view, you're also going to be paying, you're already paying utilities for um, the, the fridge in the in the common area, or two in some cases, so you can't afford for people to have fridges in their rooms, or any of those other things. Um, so that's that's kind of a an overview. I mean, the the, the lease stuff we could we could talk about for some time. Um, as I said, in a lot of cases, the parents are present, so the parents may um, want to go through it in more detail. Uh, I always email the the lease to the students and their parents in advance, so they can read it. So that on the day we don't have to go through everything in detail. We can just talk about the big things. Um, yeah, and I think that's, that's most. Yeah, of it. that's great. I mean, every one of your points, as as you and I talked about when we were preparing for this, is is this could easily build out to a course. Like each each tip is an entire module, really. So we're we're covering. You're you're doing a fantastic job covering a lot of detail in a short period of time. Um, but yeah, there's a lot we could cover. So what I'm going to do, there are lots and lots of questions on this, so I'm going to hit a few. So just answer it quick, like just you know, kind of one sentence answers, um, so that we can get onto this and move on to uh, tip number four. Are so you saying like give long-winded answers? Yeah, give long. No, I'm saying <laughs> don't. <laughs> Not that you okay. would. <laughs> it's rapid-fire questioning. All okay, right. Yes so, or no? <laughs> uh, what period? Yeah. What period do your rental agreements cover? 12 months. Great. And uh, do you rent, oh, no, that's not the one I wanted to answer. Uh, let's see. Um, do you furnish your student rentals? Uh, common areas, not bedrooms, unless um, it's specifically needed. And if it is, they, they, would, they would pay for that. Right. And what's in your common area? Common area would be a couch, coffee table, dining table, if, if space permits, um, and obviously uh, appliances, stove, Fridge freezer in the kitchen, table and chairs maybe in the kitchen, just all the functional stuff they're going to need. And what utilities do you include in the rent? So I I cover the utilities in the rent um, for mine. So yeah, it, it, the price they pay is all inclusive. All inclusive. So internet, heat, water, garbage, all that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. So internet and phone, or just internet? Just internet. Um, so yeah, on that point, quickly, uh, no phone and. These days, no cable either. I think cable used to be a staple for people, and some people still do it. I don't um, because I just find all the kids nowadays are watching Netflix or Project Free TV or whatever else they they watch online. So you want to make sure you have uh, an Internet package which is unlimited. Otherwise, you're going to get a shock when you get the bill. Um, yeah. So get unlimited, and ar around here anyway, that's $50, $60 a month uh, for unlimited Internet access. Great. So you can, get uh, Mark, student, you can get student packages as well. So I've I've said oh. to a couple of the providers I use, I'm not a student, but I, I house students, and they give me the student packages for internet access. So. 
Fantastic. And so Mark and Corinne and Ron and I think An A Angie or Angela, I've deleted it already. So hopefully, I know you guys had lots of questions around the lease and those things. So hopefully we covered it. And Rick, yes, uh, we were. you are correct in hearing that all the students are on one lease. Um, Okay, there's there's lots coming in here. So there was a couple more I wanted to hit before we. Yeah, just on. on that, just on Rick's question. So, yeah, the way that the the lease works is that um, in terms of uh, functionally how it works is is that the the students will will typically all go through it together, and then on the last page of the lease they'll all have a place to sign. So on that last page it will say you know Sally, Bob, Tony, whoever it is, they can all sign on their particular line. Um, so that they're all agreeing to the same to the same document. Great, um, pets. <laughs> you're in Ontario. <laughs> a couple people, Kevin, and a couple other people pointed out that you're in Ontario. So technically, you can't say no pets, but you can put it in your lease. Um, it just means that if they go to the rental board, it's actually not enforceable. Right. Um, okay, that's fantastic. I think there's lots more questions still on this that I've missed, but um, you guys can, you know, in this case, the squeaky wheel will get the grease. In other words, if I see your question again at the bottom of the list, I will get to it. But let's move on to number four, which also answers a couple questions. I'm not sure who was asking, if it was Ann or um, Peter or Tom, but they were asking, is it more work to manage a student rental house versus a regular rental? Um, yeah, so depends how you manage it um, would be my answer. So when I first started getting into student rentals, I was doing everything. Um, and I kind of had to get to a point after a while where I started passing some of that off because it just gets to become too much. Um, again, one of, the, one of the differences is with students is you have to manage the interaction between them and yourselves. Um, they just left mom and dad. They probably haven't lived on their own before. They're going to have a lot of questions. And if you let them, they're going to ask you all those questions. Um, they also tend to think everything's kind of urgent. They need to know, you know, what's going on about a certain situation uh, a lot. So one of the things I, one of the couple of the strategies I've implemented that will help you is um, don't give them your personal cell phone number. Um, I have a separate e-voice number which I set up so that uh, if they need to phone, they can phone, leave a message. It then sends me that to my cell phone so I can listen to it and deal with it that way. Um, but, but, but I kind of, in, when going through the lease with them, I say, if you've got issues surrounding these types of uh, areas, here's the numbers you call. Obviously, if it's an emergency, dial 911. Um, if it's a, a kind of emergency surrounding the house, so there's a leak or there's something, you know, the window's smashed or something's happened around the house, then, then I would ask them to either phone me or the property manager directly. But if it isn't urgent to that level of severity, then I ask them to send me an email. And uh, I, I tell them that uh, when I'm kind of going through this with them up front, I'll tell them that I'll respond within 24 hours. Um, and essentially, the the benefit of that is that you're gonna you're gonna cut out a lot of the noise by telling them that you're gonna respond in 24 hours. If there's some inter-house politics going on, or if they got, you know, if they're concerned that it's a degree or two too warm or too cold, they're probably not going to email you um, with the foresight that you're going to respond the following day. And make sure you do respond, you know, towards the end of the 24-hour period. Um, when I when I first got into this, I thought, yeah, I'm going to be the best landlord ever, and as soon as anybody asks me a question, I'm just going to respond fast, and they're going to be so happy they'll live there forever. But what happens is people just ask you more questions. It's like a, a tidal wave of questions come in. So you kind of almost need to be a bit standoffish. And then by doing that, people will ask you less questions when they do have serious things that they need help with. Then, of course, they'll still reach out. Um, but if you email somebody and they take, you know, it, it's the following day when they respond, it's kind of, uh, in a lot of cases, the problem may even be resolved by then, one way or the other. So avoid giving out personal phone numbers if you can, put other strategies in place. Text messaging, although convenient and although students like to do it, um, sometimes things can be lost in translation. And also text messages aren't the easiest things to record if it ever does go anywhere in terms of um, landlord-tenant board or if anything ever gets taken, taken further, 
uh, having their questions and your responses in email gives you that paper trail that you don't need to manage. If it's on text messages, then you know you're going to need to you're going to need to record those somewhere or take photographs of them and keep them. I don't know. Um, so you want to avoid that. Try and get them to email you. Again, to a student, emailing is kind of more of a pain than sending you a text message. So if they do text you on on that occasion, say you know as per our discussion, please send me an email so that we both have a record of this and I can then deal with it appropriately. Um, so that's some kind of communication stuff. Uh, and then we get into into to getting some help. So I had um, I was doing it all on my own. I kind of got to the stage where I was just getting too much uh, too much inbound communication, even with those things in place. And so I got a property manager who lives in the area, also manages other student rental properties, because you need to be there regularly. Uh, even if you have a property manager, uh, you should still to travel to the area and inspect it. Um, I mean, I, I, would, I would do it monthly at least, but quarterly or whatever you feel most comfortable with, but you still got to go and look around. Uh, because things change really quickly, um, as I'll talking about, as I'll, as I'll talk about when I get to the cleaning part, um, things can get messy quickly. There could be garbage left on the front lawn. If you're going there once a month to, to have a look at it without a property manager, then lo loads of things can change in the period of a month. Um, so the other the other kind of consideration is is that uh, not all property managers look after student rental type properties. So if you're talking to a, a property manager in your in your local area and you're going to ask them to help you, ask them about what experience they have with student rentals. Um, yeah, it's still a rental property, but the engagement's a little bit different. They're going to get different questions. They're probably going to want a bit more hand-holding. Um, so it's just something that you should have a discussion about up front. Don't be, don't be surprised about it. Like, um, like, what do you mean by hand-holding? Like they want you to change the light bulb or get, maybe give them an example? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, so smaller things which typical tenants might just take care of. Um, in student rentals, they may just, you know, leave a, a dripping tap forever or not change a light bulb or the, the garbage truck came by and picked up one bag instead of two and it's still on the front lawn. Those kinds of things <laughs> all, all happen. Um, and also to identify damage in a property, um, and it isn't something that's happened a lot, but there have been a few incidents where um, if we weren't walking around looking for things, then you wouldn't see it. So you're not necessarily looking for mess because there'll be a lot of messy student rooms, but you're looking for you're looking along the floor and along the walls and windows to make sure everything's kind of sealed and, and safe. Um, I had quite a funny um, funny student who decided one day that it would be a good idea to drill through the window frame because he wanted to put decorative Christmas lights outside of his bedroom window, outside of his bedroom window. So he drilled through the window frame to set them up. Um, and so uh, the property manager was walking walking around the place and was obviously drawn to these these uh, fantastic lights and walked over there and noticed that this, this student had drilled a hole through the window frame to set these lights up. Um, so that was another another case where we had to, to phone mum and dad and get a window frame replaced. Um, but with again back to six, five, six, even seven, sometimes people in the house, um, you, you just need to be there to identify any issues, check up on things, and make sure everything's you know ticking along nicely. And and Mike Mike's asking a question that I think a lot of people are probably wondering. Do you use a pre property manager that specializes in student rentals, or is your guy just a regular property manager? Um, my yeah, both both my property managers specialize in student rentals. Yeah, but that's not. I didn't get there. Um, I I kind of found them through uh, after managing these places myself. I, I bumped into these people sort of in the neighborhoods and um, through through the network and, and found out who they were. Um, so yeah, they do specialize. I previously had property managers who, who didn't specialize, and they, they definitely weren't used to the amount of interaction. Um, they weren't used to the, the types of demands coming from the students, which is why I said, it doesn't have to be somebody who already specializes, but they need to be prepared that it's a different engagement than a, you know, a single family or, or something else. Cool. Um, uh, okay, so anything else you want to say about getting getting help on this subject? Um, 
No, I think that's it. I just, you know, to reiterate, in my experience, if you if you're buying one student house, then it's probably something you can do on your own. If you if you have aspirations to get into a couple, then you're going to need some help or other. I have a bit of a hybrid model because I want to be involved. I just don't want to be involved all the time. Mm -hmm. So I sign the leases, I collect the money, and um, have relationship with with the students in terms of that, that um, you know, at those specific times, but my my local guys on the ground take the first call so i have this kind of full field of protection from uh from any calls which come in and obviously like a good property manager would do they only escalate things to me when it's either of an urgent nature or a certain dollar amount great um, okay, that's great. There's still there's a few questions specific um, to leases and property managers, but we'll leave that at the end. And if we run out of time, because some people are asking specific contacts, sample leases, that kind of thing, then we'll we'll basically answer that at the end and and probably suggest that people get in touch with you directly to discuss some some of those. Yeah, things. people people can reach out to me and I can we can talk about it. Okay, great. Um, all right, and, and this Mike should answer your question because you, uh, Mike, was asking, do you provide cleaning of common areas um, to keep an eye on a property or to avoid conflict with students? So that leads beautifully into tip number five. Yeah, so keeping it clean. Um, if you would like to, uh, at a later date, not now, go onto my website, you'll see a, a cleaning video which goes into this in some further detail. Um, <laughs> but uh, that was a shameless plug. Um, <laughs> it's a good but, video though, it's fun <laughs> Yeah, I try to make a boring subject interesting and I hopefully achieve that a little bit but cleaning is it, it, in, a, in a weird way it's kind of like the, the, the center of, uh, of making a student rental place successful because you're going to have taken somewhere and renovated it or, or put it into a nice situation with the hope that people are going to take care of it and um, Again, students have kind of moved from mum and dad's house into a resident, that, in, into a, a house which they're then going to be um, responsible for cleaning. So some are better than others. Some people do nothing. Some people do a lot. It really depends. But back to the lease for a minute. In the lease, you need to specify quite clearly that um, they're responsible for keeping the house clean up to a reasonable standard that should be expected. Um, if they don't keep it clean up to a, a reasonable hygienic standard, you'll bring in a cleaning company and uh, the, the bill will be charged back to the tenants and split up between them. So sometimes they don't mind. I mean, I've had to do that a few times. Um, sometimes they're like, yeah, fair enough. It's, it's, you know, it needs a good clean and they're happy for it to kind of get a, a good power clean in once every couple of months. Um, and, and then I've got other places where every time I go there it's spotless and there's the a person or two in the house who who tends to be a clean freak and just keeps everything keeps everybody else chugging along but you need to really stay on top of this you need to um, understand garbage days how many bins they need uh, but you know stick a piece of paper on the fridge with the, the schedule of the local town or city in terms of when they're going to pick it up um, and you know a good a good uh, Trial by fire for me of this was uh, was one of my well my first place was a place which had just been renovated so it had all nice kind of back to original hardwood floors brand new kitchen it was like one of those places where you're like yeah I definitely live in this it's it's uh, it's a really nice one and the students moved in and everybody was all happy and this is great and then you know self managing at this point I kind of left them to it and went back a month later. And it was filthy, like it was, the, the the dishes were overflowing in the sink, the garbage was kind of sat on the kitchen floor, leaking and just you know, not very nice. The, the the dryer was full of lint and all those types of things and towels on the floor in the bathrooms and just just not in, not in good shape. And it, you know, obviously one of the houses where unfortunately there wasn't a, a clean freak. Um, so it just got into into a bad state of repair. And it just showed me, that proved to me how quickly it can happen um, with, you know, six individuals living in a house. If they're not paying attention to that, and I didn't, I didn't reiterate it enough with them uh, as I do now, because um, that was my, my costly lesson. Um, but uh, you've really got to stay on top of it and make sure that they're keeping it clean. 
and tell them or get your property manager to tell them, come on guys, let's let's rally around and you find that students will will, will help when requested to, probably because they're used to that relationship with their parents. But a lot of the time when I'm having a tour around and inspecting places if there's even if there's kind of cans outside or um, any garbage around the property, I'll say, you know, you guys mind just going out there and, and picking some of that stuff up and, and cleaning it up and a lot of the time they'll just run out there and then and pick it up and put it in the recycling bin and um, take care of it. So, you know, it's not it's not that they're being malicious, it's just that they're they're forgetful and their their priority isn't cleaning, their priority is eating, sleeping and studying and um, being students. So um, stay on top of it and, and just make yeah. sure that it's something you watch out for. And Meryl Lee's asking a question which I think is a good one um, mm -hmm. and, and very applicable to this, checking on it being clean. Are the fact that you will be doing monthly or quarterly inspections included in your lease? Um, do they have to let you in or how do you how do you manage that? Yeah, so great question. That That is in the lease, absolutely. So um, I typically give uh, at minimum 24 hours, um, but normally a lot more than that. Um, notice before I go and do an inspection. Um, yeah, and, and sometimes if I'm just in the area or looking at other properties, I'll just have a walk around outside. I don't even go in the house. Um, but for the scheduled ones, I will notify the, the, the tenants or I'll get the property manager to notify the tenants and we'll walk around together and have a look at the place. So yeah, you absolutely, absolutely need to give them warning. You can't walk into people's um, rooms where their personal, personal belongings are without giving them notice that you're going to be there. In some cases, they'll be there too because they want to be. Um, in a lot of cases, they just write back and say thanks, and they, they're not there when you go in. Yeah, um, and Gary, Gary's chiming in on this, and Gary said, I spend $20 an hour to have the student rentals cleaned. They are my eyes and ears and keep the place clean and respectable, and they also let me know about leaky taps, etc. And this is something that I talked about in a furnished rental video that I did recently. We did the same thing with the furnished rental. We had uh, regular cleaners in there, and they also let us know about anything that we should be aware of in terms of damage or issues with the property. Uh, it's it's great if you have a good relationship with a cleaning company and you can you know set it up with your tenants that that's in in the lease or they're paying for it. Uh, it's a fantastic way to have a double check on your property. Yeah, and I've actually just started getting into that recently where I'm where I'm offering it up as an option that they can have because I've found some affordable uh, cleaning companies that they're prepared to do it. So I say, look, if you don't want to do this, then we can get other people to do it, and you don't have to worry about it. And, and Gary just includes it in his rent, is what he also noted here. So you give them the option to pay for it, but Gary's opted to have it included in the rent. Yeah, enforcing it, yeah. Absolutely. It's, I mean, that's how important it is. You want to make sure it's taken care of. Yeah, for absolutely. Sure. Cool. Yeah. Um, anything, did you talk about the garbage bins? Did you mention about how many you need and what happens if there's not enough? I think I alluded to it a bit, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, so you need those. I, I even heard from one of my... Uh, fellow investors recently that they have uh, a kind of some people may know more what this looks like than me but um, a bear box of sorts um, outside the house because they were finding that the recycling bins are getting blown around and garbage was kind of floating around so now they've got a, a bin constructed outside the house so they can fit multiple uh, receptacles in that one bin and then everything's in one central place so that's Seems like a good idea as well if you have issues with stuff not staying where it should be. Great. Awesome. Or if um, you've got bears. If you've got bears, you probably need one anyway. So. <laughs> and certainly in, in a lot of the Vancouver and Vancouver Island areas, I, I can't speak to Toronto. When we lived in Toronto, we never had any bear problems. But raccoons, oh. raccoon problems were rampant in Toronto. But, um, yeah, out here, bears are definitely an issue. But raccoons are also a big issue, keeping that stuff locked, locked and sealed. Those, they, their raccoons are quite clever. Yeah, we love raccoons. <laughs> All right, so uh, you want to get your money every month, so let's talk about making collecting rent easy. Yeah, so again, this is one of those things probably similar to the pet thing. So you can't enforce, in Ontario at least, you can't enforce how people pay, um, but you can certainly suggest how people pay and tell people how your, how your business typically works. So you're going to get people uh, asking to pay you in, multiple different ways, whether it be e-transfer, cash, check, all sorts of different things. Um, I found that a lot of the time because the parents are paying because they're countersigning that lease and then putting the payment together, the, the, most, uh, the easiest way for it to happen is to get checks. 
Um, so I, I suggest, um, and in, in most cases, almost always people people comply with this. That um, I get post dated checks, um, so they'll pay first and last uh, up front, and then uh, a post dated check for the first of each month. You can collect that for the duration of their lease, um, and then store it away somewhere safely. And then on the first of the month, you can just spend a few minutes and collect the checks and pay them into the bank. Um, I suppose that utopia would be if they if they self-manage that, um, and that does happen occasionally. If you have a group, they may just give you a check per month for, for all of them that they've kind of clubbed together and, and done the transfer side of it. Um, but still, it seems most people want to give you a, a check per person. Great. Um, um, so yeah. again, like I said, that's not, not something you can um, – can't insist that people pay that way, no. but it, this is about making um, making it easy for both parties. Really, They're, first of all, the students aren't going to remember or don't want to have to remember the first of every month that they got to pay somebody money, and you, as the investor, don't want to have to go and ask them for it every month. Like it's just a it's a step you want to avoid. So if you can collect those and have them, they're fine. Mum and dad are often paying for it. You've got the checks. You can pay them in at your leisure. Um, and it, it kind of works well for both people. So that's the way I explain it. Um, and almost always people are like, yeah, that makes sense. That's fine. In and saying that, I do so, have... Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, in saying that, I do have a few people like, oh, I just want to pay cash. And I, and I say, well, okay, uh, we'll do that then. So if they, if they absolutely won't do post their checks or they are from out of country and they don't even have checks, then sometimes... Um, and that cash can be accepted as well. So if they pay cash, then are you collecting every month? Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's so, a pain in the butt. Yeah, so I would get on the, with the, the, the one where that happens. Um, actually, I have a couple at the moment. Um, the property manager picks it up for me. Um, okay. And then he transfers me the money. Um, they'll pay into their own bank and he transfers me the money. But, like, that's just hassle. Um for them and for you know for everybody involved. So you want to aim for the for the post dated checks. Um, there are situations where some people will pay cash for the duration of their lease. Um, particularly international students, it seems, will just say, "Here's six grand uh, for the for the duration of my lease." They don't. They just want to pay for it and have that taken care of. Um, but that that isn't often the case. Most of the time. 99% of the time is post aid checks for everybody. Yeah. I think in the future, things are going to move towards e-payment um, systems more and more, especially with, with students. Um, and I know there's there's getting to be better and better programs out there. And I'm sure Mike I, – I haven't looked at the comments yet, but I'm sure Mike is mentioning one that he's been using lately that he's a big fan of. He's been talking about it on Twitter. Uh, Mike, what's your Twitter, ha Twitter handle? Twitter handle, people can ask you about it um, that way because there are some ways to do it that way and parents in the future. As the parents get get um, more savvy with the generations, the parents are younger, not younger, but have grown up with the technology more and more will be, I think, keen on paying through through e-collection. And then, then you don't have to wait for the check to, to clear in your bank account either. Yeah, for sure. I think it's going that way. I mean, this is, this is what I'm implementing today. Um, ultimately, there's still a step involved with me picking up the checks out of my filing system, going to the bank and paying them in, which at some point would be nice to avoid. Um, yeah. But because of a lot of the people I'm dealing with are at the younger end of the, the university lives, uh, the parents show up with a checkbook, and that's, been, that's just been how I've operated my business so far. Yeah, and if it's working, that's great. But something to think about for everybody else um, you know, as you move forward. I think I think it will go that way, and more and more young people don't have checks at all. <laughs> yeah, they don't. Mom and dad so, are paying us fine, but they uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> all right, awesome. So number seven, a big one is when to advertise, and some tips around advertising for everyone there. Yeah. So um, the main cycles uh, seem to be first of May and first of September, uh, in terms of when people will move in and, and start their their leases from. Um, the, the the best time in terms of when the groups of people are looking for for somewhere to live is right after the holidays in January, 
they're going to be looking for a place to to rent out as of the 1st of May. If you get them on the 1st of May, it will allow you to sign a 12-month lease all the way around till the, the end of the following April, um, which is ultimately what you, what you want. If you're going to make this model a successful one for you in terms of from the cash flow standpoint, you're going to want to make sure you have 12-month leases. You're not going to want people to take a few months off in the summer and for you to be not getting paid. Um, in saying that, a lot of the time the, the students aren't there in the summer, but you obviously still want to be getting paid whether they're there or not, um, coming and going um, over that period of time. Interestingly, in the, in the nicer houses we've had, the, the students have, have kind of come forward and said, we want to make sure we have this all year round so nobody else gets it. So they want to sign up for that duration of time. Another good reason to have a nice property and make sure it's in good condition. Um, so those are the, that's the kind of best time to advertise. People ask me all the time, does that mean I can't buy a house at another time of year? Um, I would say no. You, you can certainly find people at all times of the year. And what, what I've done in the past is, is to, um, if I bought a house kind of in, in a different time, is to get people in on leases uh, expiring on the 30th of April, um, whenever it happens to be. If you get them signed on the 1st of September or November or December, they can just let's do a lease up to the end of April and then we can reevaluate. And what that means is, is that when that, that January period hits, you can advertise your house sign on um, a lease done on May 1st and get a fresh group of people in there um, and essentially then it allows you to get the, the one year lease. So the first getting into the into the cycle may take a bit of uh, um, you know working working around but uh, once you get into the cycle you should be able to then work it over and over again moving forward. Um, a lot of the yeah a lot so a lot of the time I've I've had to start mine outside of that typical time frame and then just get on track um, when that when that's come up. There's also, you, you'll find if you, you're like, oh, damn, I missed the first paper, or damn, I missed the first September. There's, there's always people looking for nice places to live. There's always students looking for nice places to live. Um, there's the commuting students who are kind of going from, you know, around here. It might be that they're traveling from Toronto to Hamilton or Mississauga to Hamilton to go to school. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of the kids have said to me, you know, I thought this was going to work, but as soon as I got my college workload, I can't handle it. I need to live here. So then they're looking for somewhere to live. So there's, there's a reasonable amount of those. And then there's also people who maybe not enjoying where they're currently living and wanting to move. Um, so if you have a nice place, then you'll, you'll be able to get tenants at a variety of times during the year. Um, where to advertise, kind of bringing it, bringing it into this piece as well. The, the, main, um, the main audience seems to be looking at Kijiji most of the time, uh, so it's, it's free in a lot of cases. I tend to spend the money when I'm, when I'm um, trying to fill the houses to have it as the top ad for a week at a time. Um, normally you can do that for anywhere from $25 to $35 to have it as the top ad in your category. Um, and therefore, people are just going to see it more. So you want to have pictures, you want to have catchy subject lines, you want to have great descriptions with some, you know, not only the kind of functional stuff, but also to give them a feel for what the place is like. Uh, and if you if you put some effort into that, um, which again is another another discussion on its own, if you put some effort into that, you're going to get more responses, better quality responses, um, and. Kijiji seems to be the way to go. Depending on the college or university, some of them have very good off-campus housing, so I would encourage you to walk in and meet the people in the off-campus housing office, see where see where people can advertise on notice boards or their own uh, website, wherever it happens to be, and uh, make sure you're in as many places as possible. One final tip, which uh, somebody reminded me to mention yesterday was because uh, it's come up uh, fairly recently, is that if you're if you're advertising uh, for a rental property that you're in the process of buying, so um, <laughs> don't include the address. <laughs> yeah, don't include the address because people people have done that from time to time, and uh, it will cause you problems with your with your lending company. So to try and get ahead, uh, us entrepreneurial types will occasionally start advertising rooms to rent to get some interest 
prior to the actual closing date of the property or, or prior to everything, all the ducks being in a row. If you do that, that's fine. You could put, you know, a couple of interior pictures on your Kijiji ad potentially and put a, a postal code. But if you actually put the street address and it's on the internet and your mortgage company sees that and sees that it's connected with a student rental and that you're already advertising for it, you're not going to get financing. So something to be really aware of if people want to go into more detail then we can you can contact me and we can talk about it offline but um, yeah don't put the actual street address on your adverts unless you actually own the property and even then you don't need to have the actual street address on there you can say you know Main Street Hamilton minutes from the university or wherever it happens to be and then once you get people engaged and qualify them you can tell them where it is yeah, we we almost, I shouldn't say never, but we rarely put the address because we want them to call us and just do a quick pre-screening on the phone anyways. So right. we and then we'll tell them the address of the home at that time. But but yeah, and there was a lot of questions. Um I know I'm trying to look at the names here. Tom, Mike, I don't know if Mark and Corinne asked, um but lots of people were asking about financing and yes, there are issues with banks. Um if you are if you're saying it's going to be a student rental, uh, you can say it's going to be an investment property, which it is, but saying it's going to be a student rental specifically, uh, the lenders in a lot of areas aren't aren't so keen to to lend on a student rental. So, yeah, and that is that that is an expansive topic and something that. I yeah, we're not going to get into it tonight. That might be a secondary. Maybe Tim will host his own webinar on on how to get how to get financing on your student rentals. <laughs> yeah, but certainly you certainly need to have your. Uh, wits about you and be a little bit wily sometimes to, to make sure that uh, everything works well. But yeah, the, not everybody's keen on, there are some people sometimes which will lend on student rentals, but uh, it's not for everybody. So you just need to be aware of how that, how that process works. And uh, Dave had a question about how do you deal with getting notice from tenants if they intend to renew their lease? How much notice do you ask for? Yeah, so what I'll typically do is when I'm, when I'm, if you, based on the, the times we're kind of looking at now, if it's coming up to the January period, and I've got a group of um, a group who's in the house already, I will go to them and say, "Are you? do you want to um, stay on for the upcoming year um, or not? And if they don't, then you know, I'll just let, I'll let them know uh, ahead of time how that process works and let them know that we're going to be showing the, showing the, um, the house for, for people to move in on May 1st. Okay, cool. Um, and then another question came in, how do you handle different room rates when all tenants are on a single lease? So yeah, the, so the, in, some of, in some of my properties, the room rates are all the same, even though the rooms are different sizes. Um, and again, in a, in a nice property, you can do that. Uh, in other places where they're different sizes, there is, you, you have the cumulative number of the lease on the, on, the, on the front of the lease. And then on the back where they sign, there's a box which puts the, put their contribution towards the overall lease in there. So you can break down if somebody's paying 425 and somebody else is paying 475, that can go in the respective boxes next to where they sign. Perfect. All right, so um, I, this has been fantastic, and there's still quite a few questions, so if you're up for it, I will uh, will ask a few more questions from the list to help answer some of these some of the questions that are coming in. Um, but uh, if not, <laughs> it's up to you, Tim, because I know it's 10:30 in Eastern uh, Eastern World, whereas for me, you know, it's 7:30, so I'm still feeling good. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, I, okay, cool. Yeah, I put for anybody else that needs to um, head off tonight. I just wanted to put up Tim's contact information so that you can reach out and uh, and connect with him on Twitter for sure and Facebook. And there's his email address as well. And also, I, I know Lincoln, you're on Twitter and he's connected with you. Uh, make sure you connect Mike, connect with Tim as well. Mike's handle, which I mentioned for anybody who wants to talk about. Um, e-payments, uh, he's been using a program he's quite happy with. Mike's Twitter handle is M, as in Michael, uh, G927, so MG927, so you can reach out to Mike on uh, Twitter as well. So uh, yeah, fantastic stuff, Tim. I'm sure there's some cramped hands out there, but we do have more questions, so I I'll keep going. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
um, in a townhouse with a condo board, and you might not know this because I think this is your, you don't have any of these, but I'll ask it anyways. This is from Tom. Um, in a townhouse with a condo board, um, can they dictate no student rentals, as in um, only, they can only have family? I don't know the answer. To that. I don't have any in that situation. Yeah, and I don't know for sure, but I know, I, I know we've had townhouses and they say no rentals. Um, I'm not sure if, if, or they'll have a limit. You know, one of our townhouse complexes, there was, I think, 36 townhomes, and only four or six of them could actually be rentals at any given time. It was a, a horrible restriction to put on a property. But um, uh, anyways, I, I don't know if they would specifically say no student rentals, but you know what? The condo boards can pick whatever rules they want as long as everybody votes on them. So there is a very good chance that would happen. But personally, I would not mess around with having student rentals in a townhouse complex where there's a board um, because all it takes is one unhappy neighbor to cause you a whole lot of grief. Yeah, and the other thing I would be uh, concerned about there is, is whether the whether the financials would work in that situation. Um, my, the model, at least in the areas I invest in, is, is pretty, uh, pretty uh, specific based on the, the, the single family home. So uh, maybe you could get it to work, but I don't know if it would, uh, it would work so well in that instance. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, lots of people saying thank you. It was awesome. Thank you so much. So that's great. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Ron. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, and, and I'll, I'll tweet. I'll respond directly to that. Okay. How does the eviction work out? Have you had to evict somebody? No, I've threatened a few times. I mean, I've I've applied uh, for only for non-payment really. So I've given, I've handed them the the notice, and then they've turned around and paid within the allotted amount of time. Okay. Um, but I haven't actually evicted anybody yet. Have you had a, a student? This actually will answer. I think Kevin was when they're asking about this. Um, what happens if a student moves out mid-year? Have you had that happen? I have had it. Yeah. Um, so uh, again, I would go back to I would uh, you know try and recover whatever monies I could from that situation. But in essence, I would I would uh, go to the group uh, and say to the other five people in the house, Do you have a friend or somebody else who think we'd want to move into the house. If you don't, I'm going to find a student who's currently looking for somewhere and, and put them in with you. So that, that in a lot of cases will kind of rally them around to try and find somebody they know to live with them as opposed to having a, a stranger in there. Um, but if not, yeah, I'll just go out and advertise and, and, and refill the room and, and just move on. Great. Um, Mary, this is a good one. <laughs> Although I, this kind of puts quite the vision in my mind, but anyway, she's, she said, what tips do you have to manage the move out? I've heard of property managers booking a dumpster for garbage and offering a cash bonus for the prompt clean move out and return of keys. <laughs> Any other tips? I, I can't imagine having to bring in a dumpster, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, Mary, uh, Mary obviously knows what she's talking about because something something about students uh, and I guess if you kind of sit and think about it it's because probably wherever they live outside of that like with their mom and dad they ha already have their own bedroom set up so when they go into the student rental place they just buy an Ikea bed or put together a couple of things and a lot of the time they'll move out and just leave all their stuff behind like just leave all their stuff behind like I have found clothes in drawers and hung up in suitcases and I've contacted them and said, you've left all your stuff here, and they're, and they're like, well, yeah, I know, sorry, I'm not coming back. <laughs> so my uh, one of the property managers I work with has this big Ford F-350 something or other pickup truck, and uh, he's great. So whenever, whenever people are moving out, he's on hand, and he will collect the keys, and he's just a nice guy, so if they've got some stuff left behind, he'll just throw it in his truck and take it away. Um, but yeah, we do encourage people to take their belongings with them and let them know that they'll be disposed of if they don't. Um, that's just part of the business, unfortunately. we got to get rid of people's junk from time to time. <laughs> wow. Uh, you know, as I mean, I'm not a parent, but uh, if I was a parent, this would sure have me thinking very carefully about the lessons and the things I want to teach my child before yeah. they go off to university. But uh, anyway. Um, yeah, okay. I mean, finally, on that note, if they're leaving behind stuff that you want, then, you know, keep it. Um, 
What I mean by that is if they're leaving behind beds, which are in good condition, I've I've a couple of times said, let's hold on to those and put them in the garage. And then if students come in who need a bed or a desk or a chair, then uh, we've got stuff on hand to give them. Uh, so you can recycle it or repurpose it as well, which is which works well. Yeah, I like that better than just dumping it all in a dumpster. But I mean, I also yeah, it depends get what it is. Yeah, exactly. If you saw it, sometimes you want to dump it. <laughs> totally understand. Um, yeah. And somebody, uh, somebody's asking whereabouts in England you're from. Mark and Corinne, I think that was from you. Oh, um, so I grew up in in the country. I'm a country boy. Um, from in a county called Wiltshire, which is uh, for. I always tell people in North America it's kind of near Oxford, but if you know England, it's west of London on the M4, past Reading, near Swindon, down that way. <laughs> awesome. Uh, they said they're from Surrey. Oh, that's why they're asking. Well, yeah, very nice. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, okay, uh, there's so many questions here. I'm just trying to pick a few. And of course, you guys, we've given you Tim's contact information, so if you're really dying to get the answer and we don't cover it, um, then you can reach out to Tim. Let's see. Uh, oh, this is a great one, actually, because we didn't really talk about that. Uh, can you share details on how long it took you to move into investing full time? Um, so I kind of alluded to the fact that you've kicked your job to the curb, but mm. uh, we didn't really explain your journey at all. So if you want to take a couple minutes to do that. Yeah, so I, I, um, I live near a little town called Orangeville at the moment, and I bought a duplex in Orangeville. That was my, my first kind of investing foray in Canada. I previously owned some houses in England kind of when I was growing up and my first apartment I kept and rented out and bought another one and, and did that a little bit. Um, England's, I mean, for, for my uh, fellow countrymen and, and woman from Surrey would know that investing in England's hard work because there's this, there's this uh, concept called gazumping um, which which probably used to happen more than it happens now, but um, would essentially mean that when you've uh, agreed to buy a house from somebody and put an offer in, that's all well and good, but even whilst you're doing the home inspection on the other checks and everything like that, either party can pull out at any time. So what used to happen in the 80s and 90s would be that somebody would say, yeah, I'll sell you the house, and then they would kind of keep secretly marketing it on the side or leave it up in the... Uh, estate agent's window, and somebody else would come in with a higher higher offer, and they just dump the original buyer and move on to somebody else. Um, and they, there's lots of shenanigans going on around that. So when I came to Canada, long-winded answer. When I came to Canada, <laughs> and I found out this there's this magical system where people actually do what they say they're going to do, and you can buy a house and have a contract. I just thought it was amazing. So it kind of revitalized me. Um, so yeah, I decided that. I wanted to, uh, my wife has a little uh, kind of lifestyle business, which, which has helped us out a bit financially. Um, as you probably heard Julie say before, um, real estate on its own is, uh, is it probably isn't enough for a lot of people. You probably need something else. Um, so real estate for me has always been kind of building up that long-term wealth strategy uh, in terms of how do I get, uh, how do I get the lifestyle I want in the future? It's not a short-term thing. It's not easy. It's harder than harder than I was expecting, even. Um, but it's very rewarding if you if you stick at it and and get involved. So, I I planned my exit from my job. Um, I've been in sales for 15 years, and I planned my exit over over a long time, and uh, and got it to to kind of work out to my favor in the end. Um, and it worked out well. And now I'm yeah I'm doing the the student uh, investing full-time essentially and, and obviously as you can see with things like today and my website um, looking to, to help other people do the same thing so um, I think I, I think it was when uh, I'm not sure which event we we're at but I heard I've, I heard the quote quite a lot recently which is it's not timing the market it's time in the market um, and that's just so true in, in real estate you've got to, at some point you've got to get off the sidelines and get stuck in um, make the best decision you can, and then, and then you know, keep doing that, and, and keep waiting, and over time it's gonna it's gonna pay dividends.
And, and I mean, uh, Tim, I think you're being a, a, a touch modest. You've done tremendous things this year. You've done a lot of, a lot of really great deals. You've started raising money. And, uh, and you've just gone at it really. Uh, you're one of those people where when we suggest you try something or suggest you tackle something in a different way, you go do it and figure out if that's, that works for you. You just take action. And that really, I think, has been one of the critical critical reasons that you have made this transition so much faster than you initially expected that you would make um, from your job into real estate. It's, it's hard work and you, you've got clear on your why and that just drives you like very few people that we coach uh, jump in and, and really drive forward like you have in, in a single year. Yeah, I mean, I, like, I, like I said, I mean, I just see that opportunity and I just, I just want to, I mean, I just, I just, I really enjoy the, the environment you know things like this, where we get to kind of talk to other people, and um, just there's so many colorful people in in real estate. Whether you're speaking to a property manager or a tenant or a real estate agent, whoever it happens to be, you just get that. If you're a people person, then I think it's uh, I think it's great, and uh, there's just loads of different people to speak to on a daily basis. But the main thing for me is that I had to go over my fear of um, taking action. Um, and I just, and I just decided that I was just going to get stuck in and do it. And if I make a mistake, which I have done, um, like the first duplex I bought in Hamilton, <laughs> um, <laughs> then if I'm going to be making a mistake, then it's going to turn into a learning experience. I'm just not going to do the same thing, make the same mistake twice. And I, even, even though that was a, um, has been a bit of a thorn in my side, I've learned loads from it. Um, so I don't regret it at all. Great. Thanks. Um, and a couple more questions and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, and a couple people, Nicholas, Kevin, a couple other people are asking uh, for a little bit more clarity on what happens with, with your lease. So I'll read Nicholas's question, but I think it will answer a couple other people's as well. Um, don't the tenants automatically become month to month after 12 months? Um, what if they want to stay an extra month or two? Um, does this cause issues with your next 12-month lease? How do you handle it? So kind of a whole bunch of questions all piled into one, but I, a lot of people are asking similar things. So. Yeah, so um, certainly from, from the purposes of the lease, after 12 months, they would become a month-to-month -month tenant, as any normal tenant would do. Um, so if you step aside from that, from that aspect of the lease, it's more a discussion about what are they going to do next year. Um, the students generally don't want to wait until that, that, the last minute to decide, well, I'll just keep living here for a couple of months and see what happens. They want to decide where they're going to be for the next period of time. They want to be with a certain group of friends. They want to be in a certain place. They either do want to be in your house or they want to be somewhere closer or further away or wherever it happens to be. So from a contractual point of view, yes, they could go month to month if they really wanted to, to go down that road. But in terms of how I message it to them and generally how they want to be organized, um, there isn't a problem in terms of them kind of rolling over into the following year, they've they've decided they're going to move on or they're going to stay. Great. Um, and and Benoit, I, I hope I'm saying your name right. I'm not sure what specifically you're saying doesn't work in Quebec, but I'm assuming you're you're indicating. I know Quebec has some pretty stringent rental laws, so probably you're referring to what you know the way Tim handles his lease. That doesn't work in Quebec, but I'm not totally sure. Um, <laughs> and Lincoln says, just tell them you're going to move your sick mother into the house midterm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. The things that revenue does not advocate. <laughs> oh, Benoit saying after 12 months, you're still 12 months after the year. Um, yeah. I'm not totally sure that, that it's cleared up, but I, I, I get in Quebec, and this is why we said, you know, every province has slightly different rental rules, and you do have to kind of get familiar with what you can and can't do, and sometimes you can put, you can put whatever you want in your lease often, it's just that it's not enforceable, so if anybody ever took you to um, the rental tribunal, they would just say, nope, you know, <laughs> you couldn't put that in your lease, so now, you know, the tenants the tenant can do what they were doing that you didn't want them to do, basically. Yeah, I mean, no, none of these things are about being unethical. It's about, you know, uh, informing them and making sure everybody's yep. on the same page and where they want to be, so. Exactly. Yeah. Um, all right, so last question. I'll look for a good one. And everybody else, you've got Tim's contact information in front of you. Um, reach out to him on Twitter and Facebook for sure. And then if you have a, a question you want to ask him privately, you've got his email address as well. Um, 
so uh, so this is a, a big question from Mary, but I think we haven't really talked about it, so I'll, I'll throw it out there. Um, what is your expected cycle for larger renovations? Do you hold on to, actually there's a whole bunch of questions here. I'm going to stick to the renovation question because we haven't done much around that. Um, what kind of renovations or repairs do you do on an annual basis? And do you typically do these in the summer months when the property is empty or less populated? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, the way I've always been taught to do it and the way I do it would be summer months um, go in. And I think I'd, I think I run it fairly similarly to how I would do any of my other um, previous kind of rentals, which would be to look to improve something either every time somebody moves out or in the case of student rentals every summer. So I'll go and do an evaluation of the house and say, you know, what's the state of, I'm not really talking about major things like roofs or furnaces because when they happen, they happen. But in terms of flooring and bathrooms and all those sorts of things, I would give notice to the students to say we're going to be replacing the kitchen floor or putting a new shower in or whatever it happens to be. And in those kind of core summer months, they're not going to be there all the time anyway. Some of them are, but they kind of still appreciate that you're trying to improve the, the property um, and get renovations done. So, yeah, I would just say look at it every year and make sure you keep improving it and keep maintaining it and think about high traffic materials. Um, think about great things like a lower traffic master flooring and stuff like that, which will take a beating and last a long time because there's going to be people wearing shoes in the house occasionally and just that, that high traffic. So that seems to be where most of the renos get done. There's also then in, in uh, student rental investing, a lot of the time we're buying houses which are currently uh, residential properties and then converting them into student rentals after, after acquisition. So in that case, you may be looking to do some more major renos and that will just depend on when you buy it in terms of when is, when's the right time to do that. But major renos in a lot of cases is reconfiguring the basement from a, um, a big kind of games room or whatever it is today into some additional bedrooms, you know, could be relocating bathrooms, washer and dryer, and, you know, there's, there's uh, it gets all the way to, you know, basically gutting most of the house of its current um, walls and, and starting from scratch in some of the really older homes. But then you're, but then you're kind of putting it into an investment which is going to not only appreciate hopefully and get somebody else to pay down that mortgage, but you, you should be getting some, some good solid cash flow month in, month out for a long time. So that's why I try not to get hung up too much on the purchase price, especially with student rental, because if you're gonna hold it for ten years and get and get that, you know, five hundred to a thousand dollars a month in positive cash flow, um, and all the other good things that come with it, then you know, that it's not it's not the not the thing that you should be only, the only thing you should be focused on. Absolutely. All right. Well, th thanks, Tim. This is fantastic, and there's still tons of questions coming in. But uh, I, I'm going to call it a night, <laughs> yeah. and people people can reach out to you. So thank you so much. Uh, this was fantastic. There was so much great information here, and people people just loved it. The the thank yous uh, have been pouring in. Um, everybody's saying thank you. Nicholas is thanking you. Mark and Corinne are thanking you. The, the, the thank yous are just pouring in. So you did a fantastic job. You covered so much. And uh, you know, every one of these things could have been uh, could have been their own webinar practically. So, so this was this was amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time to to teach everybody all of these lessons. I really really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thanks everybody. All right. So reach out reach out to Tim. Connect with him. And uh, yeah, and of course connect connect with us if you haven't already. And thanks again, Tim. And uh, I will call it a night. So good night, everybody. All right. Thanks, guys.